The castle that we are showing you around today has a family lineage dating back to around 1150 CE, beginning with a man known as Dolphin, who was most likely of Viking descent. He chose Lothar as a place to call home for its natural beauty, wealth of trees, and game to hunt. The name Lothar itself is believed to have originated from Old Norse, meaning foaming river. Dolphin's great-great-grandson, Hugh de Lothar, was the first of the Lothars to truly make a mark in history. Hugh was born around 1250 and grew up to become a lawyer. His notoriety in his profession began as early as 1274, for his pleas brought around the northwest of England. As his reputation grew, so did his position and honours. He was a shrewd accumulator of land, who in 1283 gained the right to impark at Lothar, meaning to enclose land and hunt its game. In 1290 he was appointed King's Attorney. The title of attorney afforded the ability to commit the master to a particular plea. An attorney's presence would replace the need for the accused to attend. This, of course, was of great advantage to wealthy landowners, who would regularly be involved in various suits in court. When Edinburgh fell to King Edward I of England in 1296, Hugh was made sheriff. Not long after, he became a justice in Eyre, meaning the highest magistrate of forest law. In 1305, now knighted, Sir Hugh entered Parliament. This was the beginning of a 600-year tradition of Lothars in national politics. Hugh de Lothar II, son of Sir Hugh, was loyal to the English crown and played his role in many of the skirmishes between the English against the Scottish. He may even have taken part in such battles against William Wallace and Robert the Bruce. In 1345, 30,000 Scots overran Penrith and took thousands of people prisoner, who were later sold as cattle north of the border. This might have been what prompted Hugh III to replace the Moat and Bailey Castle the Lothars had been residing in with a peeled tower. A tall, fortified structure allowing the inhabitants to spot from far away any approaching marauders. The accumulation of land did not cease, regardless of the family's propensity for battle. Hugh III increased the number of manors their family possessed, and through marriage to Margaret de Wale, garnered further land within Lothar. This repetition of purchase and marriage for land continued down the bloodlines. By the 16th century, Henry VIII of England broke away from the Roman Catholic Church. This increased the hostility between the Scots and English, and dissent from his nephew James V of Scotland came to a head in 1542, and the Battle of Solway Moss ensued. Sir John Lothar, at age 55, a deputy captain of Carlisle Castle and beset with gout, fought at the battle. For his role in the victory, he was elevated to captain. Ten years later, he died, bequeathing his estate to his grandsons, Richard and Gerard Lothar. Sir Richard Lothar was eventually made deputy captain of Carlisle Castle, just as his grandfather was. In 1568, Mary Queen of Scots was fleeing Scotland after a defeat in the Battle of Langside against opposition forces acting in the name of her own infant son, James VI who was just two years old at the time. Queen Elizabeth I of England, who was cousin to Mary, Queen of Scots, asked Sir William Cecil to write to Mr. Loder, Deputy Captain of Carlisle, to know if she may safely come hither. On the 18th of May, Mary was taken into protective custody at Carlisle Castle. She later wrote to Elizabeth to thank her for the good reception which I have had in your country, and principally from Mr. Lothar, who received me with all courtesy. In 1617, the Lothar estate was in need of investment, Sir John I, through his far-sightedness, left the estate and family finances considerably improved by the time of his death. Sir John II, the grandson of Sir John I, made further enhancements to the estate and laid out the gardens. In 1682, he purchased the village of Lothar, displacing the villagers residing there. Nine years later, the tower of the estate had begun to fall into ruin, and so decided to embark on rebuilding the house entirely. It cost £6,460 for work on the house, and a further 9,000 spent on stables and offices, a total cost of almost 4 million in today's money. Daniel Defoe, author of Robinson Crusoe, is said to have remarked that the Lothar estate was the wonder of England. John's eldest son, Richard, took over after his death. However, Richard contracted smallpox and died in 1714, aged just 21. So it was left up to the younger brother, Henry, to pick up the mantle. In 1718, because of the Stuarts' malpractice to not sweep the chimneys, a fire broke out in Lothar Hall. Many treasures perished in the blaze and the whole central building burned down within a couple of hours. When Henry died in 1751, leaving no heir, the house remained a charred shell. The line of direct succession was broken and so the estates were passed to a cousin, Sir James Lothar. However, he was more frequently known as the Tyrant of the North, Jimmy Graspall, Earl of Toadstool, or simply Wicked Jimmy. He was said to be able to show great charm and humor one moment and then could explode with furious rage the next. One of his principal sources of income were the coal fields around Whitehaven. At their newly sunken mine, Saltam Pit, 
he installed one of the earliest steam engines to help with drainage and hauling loads to the surface. At the time Whitehaven could be considered second in importance to Great Britain only to London, when measured by tonnage shipped out of its harbour. A harbour that was envisioned by his grandfather, who originally built a pier there. Wicked Jimmy was consumed by the pursuit of power. He spent vast sums of money on elections. He eventually controlled enough rotten boroughs, a term for a constituency where the electorate was so small it could be easily influenced by a patron to gain unrepresentative influence, to be able to return nine MPs of his choosing to Parliament. One of these included a man who would eventually become the youngest of the 55 Prime Ministers of Great Britain, William Pitt the Younger. Wicked Jimmy invited several prominent architects to come up with designs for the rebuilding of the still charred Lothar Hall. Some were asked to design a castle, however no designs were ever commissioned. He consolidated his power and wealth by marrying another coal heiress, however his marriage bore no heir for him. He died in 1802 and his fortunes, along with the remains of Lothar Hall, passed along to his third cousin and godson, Sir William Lothar of Swillington. Upon taking up the estate, William placed an advert asking anyone who had believed they were owed money from his predecessor to come forward and claim their dues. Included in the claimants were the Wordsworth family, who were paid with interest on a debt to the father of the poet William Wordsworth, a solicitor to Wicked Jimmy who was never paid. Under Sir William Lothar, a building to replace the burnt and tattered Lothar Hall was constructed. The commission was handed to a talented 26-year-old Robert Smirk who would go on to design such institutional buildings such as the British Museum. Robert proposed the designs for a castle in the Gothic Revival style. The cost of the commission was estimated to be to the tune of £150,000, or over 12 million when adjusted for inflation today. After 12 years, the Lothar Castle that we see today was complete, and at only half the cost of the original estimate. The magnificence of the castle's exterior was equally matched by William's and his son's prestigious art collections. By 1825, within William's study alone, there hung paintings by artists such as Tiziano Vicelli, Bartolome Esteban Murillo, and Sir Anthony van Dyck. After William died, his eldest son William continued collecting art after inheriting the Lothar Castle. Upon his death in 1872, he had no heirs, so the estate passed along to his nephew Henry and then continuing down the Lothar family lines. In 1895, in honour of Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany visiting, the building you see here in the grounds of Lothar Castle was built. Clearly enjoying his first visit, upon returning to Lothar Castle again in 1902, he gave Hugh Lothar the 5th Earl of Lonsdale a knighthood of the first class of the Order of the Prussian Crown. His tastes were expensive, spending today's equivalent of over £300,000 a year on cigars alone. When travelling he insisted his dogs have their own first class rail carriage, and took with him a 24-piece orchestra. However, this life of extravagance couldn't continue forever. Coal no longer brought the income it once had. Land rents were in decline, and so he began to sell the family properties. In 1936, he left Lothar Castle for good, never to return. During World War II, any non-industrial premises were requisitioned for use as hospitals, schools, and bases for the army. One of these being Lothar Castle, which in 1942 became home to the 49th Tank Regiment. Here was home to an experimental secret weapon called the Canal Defence Light. The name was used to conceal its true purpose. This was a light mounted onto a tank's turret for the purpose of allowing nighttime attacks where friendly forces could highlight enemy positions. The power of this light was so great that it was claimed a squadron of 16 tanks operating simultaneously could enable someone up to five miles away to read a newspaper in the streets. 20 million pounds was spent on developing the weapon, adapting 1,850 tanks to carry it and training 6,000 troops to operate it. However, it never saw active combat the generals of the day who might have utilised it were largely unaware of its existence. After the death of Hugh Lothar in 1944, the estate finances were severely depleted. Lancelot Lothar inherited what was left. Dry rot and penetrating damp were rampant throughout Lothar Castle. So in March 1947, the largest ever country house auction got underway. Over four months and 18 separate sale days, 7,839 lots were placed under the hammer. In 1953, Lancelot died and the inheritance passed to his grandson, James Hugh William Lothar. Allegedly for him, Lothar Castle represented the worst excesses of the past with its 200 plus rooms. James tried to sell the castle as an institute of some kind, but failed to find a buyer. So he then sought to demolish the castle, but protests from the people of Penrith prevented this. Therefore, he decided to partially demolish the castle by removal of the roof, which also helped avoid taxes, and strip the insides leaving only the facade we see today. With the invention of English heritage in 1999, the steady decay of Lothar Castle and its gardens came to an end. 
Keen on preserving this national treasure, the Lothar Castle and Garden Trust was formed with the help of Jim Lothar, who purchased the estate from his father for one pound. Years of painstaking work has paved the way for a magical lost garden that you can now explore and appreciate. It is still very much a work in progress, but we hope to have captured and brought to you some of its magnificence and history.